This is a story about when Japanese Americans, 120,000 uh, Japanese Americans were incarcerated during World War II in internment camps all throughout the West. We wanted to talk about this because there was a camp at Gila River just south of Chandler on the Gila River Indian community that held about 16,655 Japanese Americans. The term gaman is important to the exhibit because it talks about uh, this concept in Japanese culture, enduring the seemingly unbearable with patience and dignity. And that's how uh, many Japanese Americans experienced this incarceration during World War II. Shortly after uh, Pearl Harbor, um, there was a lot of fear about the, the country being attacked. And there was definitely fear amongst people, especially in the West, of uh, the Japanese Americans that lived there. So in February of 1942, Executive Order 9066 was signed by President Roosevelt, which led to the ability of the military to forcibly remove Japanese Americans who lived on the West Coast in parts of Arizona to be uh, removed from their homes and then relocated into camps throughout the West. There were 10 of these camps. Uh, they are known at the time as internment camps, but today we call them incarceration camps because they were incarcerating these people against their will uh, for an indeterminate amount of time. Once these uh, orders were released in February, shortly thereafter these notices of relocation or exclusion were posted up all over people's uh, neighborhoods and they were told that they had to leave their homes typically within a week, week and a half to two weeks time and they could only bring a few things, basically two bags, whatever they could carry themselves. Fairly quickly, they had to go to these assembly centers and be relocated until the camps could be built. And the one that we talk about in this exhibit is the Gila River Relocation Center that was just south of Chandler. As part of the relocation process, each family member was given a paper tag with their family name, family number, um, and they were supposed to put this on themselves and on their, their own personal belongings so that they would get to the camp correctly. These became a symbol of this incarceration process. And so we have here in the exhibit this tower of, of paper tags. These are actually, this is an art project called the Tag Project by uh, an artist, Wendy Maramura, um, who produced 10 of these towers, one for each of the internment camps. Um, this tower represents Gila River and it represents the 16,655 people that were incarcerated at, at Gila River. These are actually reproduction tags that were made by volunteers where each individual's name was written with the appropriate family number that the family was given and then they were distressed and stained so that they would look to be original. But this is a of what it looks like to see the full impact of what 16,655 people all in one place is represented. Once they came to the camps, they would be put into these barracks. These barracks were long, quickly built rooms, and a family, regardless of its side, would often be put into one room, uh, typically 20 feet by 10 feet, and they had to just find enough space for, for everyone to live in. And so these, uh, this represents here is just a, what it might have looked like because typically they were given a cot and a pot belly stove and then whatever they brought. On the wall over here, we actually have some photographs of the time that shows what it was like to be removed from home. Um, you can see on this photo, the bags being lining the street as people are getting ready to go to the place where they would sit, the, the assembly centers, before they would be sent to the camps. And you can see there's each individual could carry two bags, and so these are the various bags that the families have put together. Uh, the next photo is a photo of two ministers, one uh, white American minister and a Japanese American minister. Um, they were friends and the white minister was there to see off his friend. And here he is putting the paper tag on his friend as they're preparing to leave. You can see here a couple children standing in line with the paper tags on, really concerned because most of these people had no idea where they were being sent. They were being sent to camps in the interior part of the West often isolated in desert conditions. And so many of these people were faced with the fact that they were leaving home 
with very few of their personal belongings, not knowing whether they were ever gonna be able to come back home, how long they might be at the camp, or what their future might hold. And so, especially as you see the last photo, you'll see a couple children, and you can just imagine what they're, what they're feeling as they're trying to understand what is about to happen to them. We have a large photo on the wall here that is Frank Fuji, an incarcerated individual at Gila River, and he's standing on a butte looking over one of the two camps that made up Gila River. You can actually see the barracks there all lined up, typically in blocks, where you'd have these barracks with the rooms that people would live in, and then also other buildings like bathrooms and mess halls and recreation halls. In the exhibit, we have many different panels that talk about what led to um, incarceration and also you know, where people came from and its direct connection to Arizona. But as you can imagine, oftentimes when people arrived on train and got out at camp, this was the first time that they even realized they were gonna be in the Arizona desert. Now, oftentimes once they got to camp, they had to start to try to make a life for themselves. And one of the things that they would do was get a job. And so there were many different jobs in the camp, but one of the, the big things that happened at camp was they had agricultural fields, agriculture and dairy fields. Um, they raised food that would feed the people at the camp. And actually Gila River was such a good agricultural site, they actually raised enough food to also send to some of the other camps as well. And so these are some of the implements and photos of people um, as they're here in camp working their jobs and raising some of the food that was feeding not only themselves but other incarcerees. But as you can imagine, life in a camp, especially living in a communal building with communal mess halls and whatnot was a, was a challenge. And so oftentimes you were looking for things that would try to make life more like what you expected. And so they would do with whatever they could to get to that normal life. One of the things that we have a feature of an object over here is the sandals known as geitas. Uh, these are a traditional Japanese uh, footwear. These they would wear so that they didn't have to walk across the dirt um, to go to the, to the shower facilities or the restroom facilities. But unfortunately, many of them had not brought them with them. So uh, oftentimes they were building them out of scrap wood that might have been left over from the building of the camp. And that's exactly what you see here. But life in camp was, life had to go on. One of the things uh, was they would do crafts. They would uh, take in their spare time. They would find things locally like wood from the desert and they would craft them. So here you can see there's a, there's a pen. There are a couple vases. Um, there's even a, a small little pin made uh, to look like a leaf. But also they, they made other things like the, the, a necklace there that is made out of uh, rolled paper. Um, so that people could uh, pass the time. Another one of the features, things in this exhibit that you'll see is the, the yearbook, because yes, school had to continue. Children were in the camp, still needed to go to school, and so there were schools, everything from pre-kindergarten to um, elementary school all the way up to high school. And this is one of the yearbooks for 1945 for the Butte High School camp. As I mentioned, recreation was important in the camp. This was the first time that both men and women of Japanese American descent sometimes had the opportunity to take part in, in recreation. Oftentimes these folks had farms or businesses that led them to work many long hours when they were back in California. However, there was a lot of time, extra time at the camp. And so they actually built recreation halls for people to gather and do things. And one of the favorite pastimes, especially of older men, was this traditional Japanese strategy game called Go. We have a wonderful photo of the older gentleman playing Go. They could play this for hours at a time. Ladies also had the opportunity for recreation. Oftentimes, especially for women, um, this was the very first time they'd ever experienced any kind of recreation at all. Oftentimes home would mean that they were caring for the home and then they would have a job during the day to help the family out as well. So once at camp, they would do their job and then have some free time. And so there were organized examples and classes for, for Japanese American women to learn um, various crafts. And so here you can see a purse that is crocheted with wooden handles and then the handles are actually painted with a scene from 
um, the camp. You can actually see that's Butte Camp because you can see the water tower on top, the little saguaros, and a couple of the camp buildings as well. There were knitting classes as well as you know, sculpture and carving classes. There were dances, social dances, as well as parades, just like everyday life. The Japanese Americans showed that sense of gaman, trying to find a sense of normalcy um, in, in something that is anything but normal. Now probably one of the greatest ways that all sorts of people from the camp found a sense of normalcy was America's game, America's pastime, baseball. Um, baseball is incredibly important to the Japanese American culture and actually there were many different semi-pro Japanese baseball leagues in California specifically um, at, uh, in 1930s and 1940s. Um, and one of those semi-professional uh, baseball players was the name of Kenichi Zinamora, and we tell a bit of his story here. Kenichi was a semi-professional uh, baseball player in California, sort of known as the father of Japanese-American baseball in California. And he was incarcerated here uh, at Gila River. Um, he was very upset about it, um, but after uh, just a couple weeks, him and his uh, sons, started to go out into the desert just outside of camp and began the idea of creating a baseball field. So soon, uh, him and his sons, as well as several men from camp, started to create a baseball field, and baseball leagues started to form. The camp had all different levels of baseball, everything from uh, children all the way up to adults. Uh, men and women all played baseball. And these games were incredibly competitive to the point that there were all sorts of championships. And so as these various teams would form up, there would be natural places to do competitions. The baseball uniform you see there is actually the baseball uniform worn by one of the members of that team. And he brought that with him from California. Each of them oftentimes you would see had slightly different uniforms because they were bringing the uniforms that they had from their hometown. Probably the greatest and most famous game ever played here at Gila River was a game in 1945 played against the Arizona State Baseball High School champs from Tucson. So the high school state championship team came up from Tucson and came into the camp and played the Gila River All-Stars to a game that was very well received both from the camp and from the team itself. They planned to play a second game, a follow-up game down in Tucson and unfortunately, political fear would not allow the people of Tucson to allow these incarcerated people to come down and play in Tucson. And so the letter that you see there is actually a letter from Kenichi Zinomura to the coach of the Tucson baseball team explaining that unfortunately they wouldn't be able to come and that hopefully after the war they could all come together as American citizens and play a game together. There's lots of stories that are part of this exhibit. And to really get a sense of how many and how many people this touched, we produced this wall. This wall lists all of the 16,655 people that were incarcerated at Gila River Camp. You can see the names here, and then you'll also notice there are some colored dots next to them. This was a way for people that were visiting the exhibit, whether they're a former incarceree themselves, a family member of an incarcerated person, or maybe just a friend, they could actually represent the people that they knew. And so that's what you see there um, with the various colored dots. It really gives a very deliberate sense of what 16,655 people sent away from their homes without uh, due process, what it really meant. Another key component of the exhibit was a public art piece that we actually produced with the public. We wanted, again, another way to show what 16,655 people would look like. And so we actually asked the public, would you fold a paper crane? So uh, there's a tradition in Japanese culture that if you fold a thousand cranes, you can earn a wish. And so during a, a, a different project where we were looking at Japanese internment, a former incarcerate by the name of Tetz Furukawa gave us, gave the city of Chandler, a thousand paper cranes with the hope that a similar thing would never happen again. And so as part of our exhibit on uh, Gila River, we, we asked the public to fold a crane. In just a few months, we had 
all 16,655 cranes. And so high above the exhibit, we hung each of those cranes to represent those people. And it's quite a stunning display, but I was told by a, a former incarcerate who came and said, you know, I, I see the cranes and I love the way they look, all the different colors and the different sizes and shapes and approaches. But he said, what I'm really stunned by is the shadow of the cranes, because if you look at the shadows of the cranes, it also somewhat seems to appear like the barbed wire that ran along the fences of the camp. And so it seemed like a great way to actually show um, both um, that sense of gaman, that sense of, of, of surviving um, and thriving in a situation that seems unbearable with grace and dignity. And so that's why uh, we, we named the exhibit uh, Gaman. And so this was this uh, very poignant and important story that we wanted to tell. A story that um, affected lots of people from California that were relocated to this area, but also directly affected Chandler. The people of the camp often would have jobs outside um, and worked for folks uh, in Chandler. People of Chandler would bring supplies down and would visit the people here. And so forever there is this relationship between Chandler and this camp. And we wanted to ensure that this story would be told for, for many generations and that we wouldn't forget uh, this time in our history.